All right, welcome back everyone to the Flow Track Podcast. I'm Kevin Sully. Pleased to be joined on this episode. Former NCAA champion, made two appearances for Canada at the World Championships Outdoors. He runs for the Reebok Boston Track Club. It's Justin Knight. Justin, thanks for coming on. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Kevin, thank you for having me again. It's always a pleasure to be on here with you guys. You've been on so many times on so many different podcasts. When I was getting prepped for the interview, I had to look back. Like you've outlasted so many different show titles, so many different employees. It's like the one constant has been Justin Knight, either winning races, out kicking people, or appearing on 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 flow track shows. We should be probably be thanking you. <laughs> no, I should be thanking you guys. You guys have uh, shown me a lot of love throughout my years. Definitely helped me build the fan base. So thank you guys. I want to start first, uh, because as people might know, tuning into the podcast, we released that flow film out that we did with you in Syracuse back in 2017. But like I said, there's a lot of Justin Knight content out of there. But I watched the Syracuse film recently to, to prep with the interview. And what jumped out to me, Justin, is just maybe how little has changed, because you still have the same coach. Some of the people that were on your team then are either training partners or you, you still work out with to this yeah. day. Does it feel to you like very little's changed despite the fact that you've made world championship teams since then, you've represented your country on an international stage and you've gone pro? Yeah, I mean, I feel like not much has changed. Fortunate for me, I've kept the same coach. Um, a lot of those workouts are the same, but a lot faster, I guess you can say. Um, now, obviously, we're not in Syracuse anymore. I'm currently based out of Charlottesville. So I guess the workout venues and um, facilities have changed a little bit. But uh, at the end of the day, I see the the same teammates I would work out with uh, mostly at Syracuse. And uh, I get the same workouts, so I can't complain. What do you miss most about college? Because you come across in that film as someone who really loves to be in college, <laughs> someone who really loves his, his <laughs> university. What do you miss about it? Um, you know, I find myself reminiscing a lot about Syracuse. Syracuse was a phenomenal school for me. Um, the overall school, that athletic department, the academic department have treated me with uh, so much love and respect. I think uh, what I miss the most is just kind of my, my teammates as a whole. Obviously, I have some of them here, but uh, we had some really good memories uh, back at Q's and obviously winning NCAAs as a team was one moment that stood out for me. Um, also, the one thing I miss a lot is I, I had a phenomenal training staff uh, at Syracuse as well. Uh, shout out to Brad Pike and uh, all the other trainers that I had over there. But um, it was just a great environment for me. I loved every minute of it. What do you wish you knew back then that is common knowledge to you now? Uh, what do I wish? I think, uh, you know, adjusting to the pro life. Um, I had a, a, a pretty rocky start, I'm not going to lie, <laughs> getting dead last at New Balance Grand Prix. But um, I just wish I, I could tell myself that, like, you have to keep working hard. Uh, you can't rely on others to hold you responsible for the tasks that you should be doing. And, um, you know, that's the sort of stuff that I'd like to follow through with if I could go back. Mm -hmm. In the, in the film, you guys bring up, you and a couple of your teammates, just how Martin Hare was like the soul of that team and how it was tough You know, once you graduated to replace that. I take it from that comment, it doesn't surprise you the success that he's had recently where he's crushed the marathon and doing seemingly 10 other things at once uh, in med school. <laughs> Is that you knew that, Martin, back when you were in, in Syracuse, I assume? Yeah, if there's any person that could live Martin's lifestyle I guess it would only be Martin he um <laughs> he's been a tremendous role model to me from the moment I stepped foot on campus I remember uh my first practice at Syracuse uh there was at least maybe six or five or six guys that were better than me just on based on the roster and um immediately I wasn't focused on like the, the fourth best guy or the third best guy I was just focused on Marty and I knew that at the end of my career I wanted to be for the team what he was to me and um, yeah, I just think like what he's doing in life is not easy. And I, I don't think there's many people that could actually achieve what he's achieving right now. And um, it's really an inspiration just to know him personally 
and see him accomplish all the stuff that he's done. Is there anything you've been able to pull from from him, or is he just completely a unique character that if you try to uh, <laughs> replicate what he's doing, it's going to end up bad for, for everybody else? <laughs> well, I mean, when I was in college, there was a lot of stuff that I tried to replicate from him, just, uh, you know, attitude, mindset. Um, the way he approaches workouts, the way he approaches races. Uh, I learned a lot of stuff from him and a, a lot of guys on the team, whether they're better than me or not. Um, I think even just seeing him now go through med school is just, uh, he's kind of shown me that things in life aren't perfect. Like sometimes, you know, you might have to get up at 5 a.m. to go do that workout. And I think for him to be able to do that and still be competitive, it shows me that um, you can still achieve your goals no matter the path that you choose to get there. So it might look like it's a little inconvenient, but if you work hard, you can still get the same result. Another video feature featuring you that we put on the site was the Peyton Jordan behind the scenes. And I was on that shoot, Lincoln and I did that, did that shoot. Yep. And so I have some firsthand knowledge of that. First of all, that Airbnb you guys had in Palo Alto was pretty nice. I'm, I'm just gonna say, yeah. that was a pretty good setup you had. Uh, and second, what, stuck out to me from that shoot and i was only there the first couple hours and then jeremy bothered you with the camera all the way leading up to it but just how calm you were uh, i know it's peyton mm. jordan and for you that had been routine by that point and you're a pro and it's not the peak of your season like maybe it would be for for somebody else but you were just like you are right now completely even keeled you didn't seem irritated if we you know, you which went out and shot hoops a couple hours yeah. before the race. Uh, I, I'm assuming that's pretty. Is is that in line with with, with Justin in every in every pre race, or were you putting on a a show for us? <laughs> well, let me say first and foremost, you uh, you guys caused me a lot of trouble with my friends putting up all those missed uh -oh. shots that I had. <laughs> so I, I've I've had a a couple arguments with my friends saying that oh they only post the shots that I missed. <laughs> but uh that is true if you watch no, the whole thing you got hot you got hot towards the end there yeah, yeah i i heated up towards the end i think that rim was a little bit off too but um <laughs> i think definitely it took me time to become that justin uh as i said my freshman year um i was still a i would say an impressive freshman like i i had a pretty easy uh adjusting period to adjusting to being an ncaa athlete but I used to be shaking on the line and even moments before the race. And I had great teammates like Martin, Colin, Joel Hubbard, um, Andrew Palmer, Joe Cush, guys like that, just to kind of teach me, you know, how to go about preparing for ACCs or Peyton Jordans mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And um, by the time it was my sophomore year, um, I kind of had that realization that the work is done. You know, you worked hard, you did everything that you had to do. And right now you can't be worrying about a moment that's not going to come until it's actually race time. So um, I'm a pretty calm guy. Even people ask me like, what type of music do you listen to? And, you know, they're surprised that I'm not having like Meek Mill or like some super hyped up music. It's like some Justin Bieber or something in the background just to, to keep me really calm. But um, I try to save all my adrenaline for the race. Yeah. You mentioned that in the piece that you had to tone down the music because the music was getting you <laughs> too hyped. Yeah. Uh, I think it well, was while Wisconsin. we're on the top of Yeah. Oh, is that the turning point? Yeah, I think Wisconsin my freshman year, I, I had a wicked playlist set up and I was so pumped up. But then by the time I got on the line, I just felt tired. I felt like I already ran the race. So from that moment on, I had to put like a much calmer playlist. Yeah. Speaking of music, also in that piece, you reveal something from your past that I don't think we gave, we zoomed in probably too much on the missed shots in basketball and we did not pay attention <laughs> enough to what you mumbled to one of your teammates about staying up till 5 a.m. in a previous Peyton Jordan to download a new Drake album and your coach was not happy about that. Explain. Yeah, I, I think that was the close, that's the first time that Coach Fox actually came really close to yelling at me. But um. It was a well-anticipated album. I think, what was it? <laughs> it was either What a Time to Be Alive or like nothing. Not nothing was it. I think it was What a Time to Be Alive. And um, he's been like hinting that he was going to drop it for a while. And then like, I think, yeah, the night before, I just like stayed up really late. 
waiting for him to drop it at like 12, but it actually like dropped at like, I don't know, like 5 a.m. or something. And then I had to like go to, I had to go to the store or sorry, this wasn't the mm-hmm. night before the race. This was two nights before the race, but I had to okay. go to the store. Yeah. I had to go to the store and one of my teammates drove me to the grocery store to get an iTunes card because I didn't have like a Apple music at that point. <laughs> and then I got the car, downloaded it, listened to it before I went to sleep and it, it hurt me in that race. It probably cost me the Olympic standard. <laughs> How, how'd your coach find out? Oh, I told him. We we have a good relationship. <laughs> I, I don't lie to Coach Fox about anything. <laughs> So he said in the debrief, hey, Justin, was the training too hard last week? What, did you have any injury issues? You're like, no, it was this Drake album. That's what it was. It was just Drake. <laughs> Blame him. Well, you, it's funny enough. So it didn't happen in the order that you would think it happened. I told him before the race. And before the race, he kind of blew it off. And I almost thought that he didn't hear me. But then after the race, he told me, he's like, I was so mad that I didn't want to freak you out before the race, but like, then he had a serious talk with me afterwards. He said, "Like, dude, you gotta act like a pro. You can't be doing stuff like that." And uh, I understood it. I mean, it wasn't worth it. The album was amazing, but uh, it kind of cost me an Olympic bid, I think. <laughs> yeah, the music was good, Drake. But could you have waited? To, could you put it out at nine p.m.? Could you could have done at nine p.m.? Do Justin a solid there. Well, I mean. In your defense, you're in college. You you make mistakes. Yeah. You don't necessarily. You, I thought it was one night before. I thought it was one night before. Not that two nights before again is that much better because it's still just an album. But I yeah. think you, you get a I little bit of latitude off. there. Yeah, I thought I was doing some thinking after a while, and it was two nights before. But I basically pulled an all nighter because I stayed up till four. <laughs> so it was like, yeah. you can call it whatever you want. <laughs> Uh, that's amazing. Uh, the last race you had in 2021 was out here in Austin, I believe. I had a chance to chat with you just oh, briefly yeah. after that one. What did you take out of that race? You run a 336. You beat a lot of people who specialize in the 1500. What did that tell you about your ability at the longer distances this year? Yeah, um, I was really impressed with the the 1500. I think I think we went out in 155. I'm not sure. And then we kind of hit the brakes and I was able to actually close pretty well. Um, I think the one thing that I'm trying to do is make sure that I have the wheels for um, when a move's being made with that last mile to go at the Olympics that I'm still in conversation. And um, the way I'm training is like, I haven't been training doing a bunch of speed stuff. Like I've actually been focusing on getting stronger and stronger and stronger. So um the 336 like that wasn't something that i was like tapering for or something that i've been you know working on it's it's a part of my training like it's almost like a tune-up and um i was just really happy with how it went um i felt really strong i felt like i was able to maintain that pace which was the strength part and um the speed is always there you just have to tap into it a little bit Mm. is the plan this year to focus just on the five or do you think you'll you'll venture up too. <laughs> um, I, uh, uh, right now I think like I'm, I'm trying to actually run fast enough to where I would have the 1500 meter standard. Um, I don't know what I would do with it if I would actually pursue it or oh, not. Oh, wow. But yeah. I, I mean, it's just kind of, so you're not goals, thinking 10 K think. at all. You're not thinking 10 K at all. You're thinking <laughs> the other direction. <laughs> no, I actually, I have a funny story about that. It's like, I remember my freshman year at Syracuse, um, my first outdoor race that I ever ran was at UVA at the Virginia challenge. And I don't know why coach Fox would do this, but like, I think the day, I think the day of the race, like not like right before the race, but he was telling me, he's like, Hey, enjoy this 1500 because after this, you're going to run a bunch of 10 Ks. And I was just like a 10 K <laughs> there's no way I'm doing that. And I was going back and forth with them. And I was like, all right, coach, if I run faster than like 340 and at this point in my career my pr was like 347 in high school and i told him if i run faster than 340 do you promise not to enter me in a 10k for the rest of the year and he's like sure what the heck whatever let's do it and i ran 339 and like i was happy that i won the race but i was actually even more happy that i didn't have to run a 10k for the rest of the year so (laughs) okay so wait are are you serious though about the about the 15 if you get the standard, is that something you'd entertain or is it five? Uh, 
I mean, I would be, I would, the main focus is the 5k. I just think that a part of my training and a part of getting stronger mm-hmm. and faster, I would have to run. I, I would like to run a fast 15 to get the standard. Like it's just a part of my mm-hmm. goals, but, um, the 5k is the main focus. Um, I think honestly, I don't know what my season entails, but I wouldn't be opposed to running a 10k. I know I'd be really good at it, but, um, the main focus is the 5k for now. Mm -hmm. because i was going to ask you what do you think right now is the harder event internationally the the five or the ten but if you're not even considering the ten then you don't need to worry about that i guess i always can i consider everything i i like to think of myself as a double edge or even i don't know if it makes sense to be a triple edge sword like i i like to be competitive in the 15 all the way to the 10k um -hmm. so i'm always paying attention and seeing who's wanting running what races I would say, I think the 5K is actually a little bit tougher right now. Um, you got guys from the 10K that are dipping down into the 5K. And you got 1,500 meter guys that are dipping up into the 10K. So I think like the 5K is a little bit more heavy with talent right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 10,000 has the Farah factor, but we don't know if he's <laughs> going to be the Farah of, of, of old or what's going to go go into that decision. I mean, he might run the five, I guess, yeah. too. He said he's only doing the 10, but I don't I don't know what he's doing. But yeah. then in the five, you have, you figure y- Jakob Ingerbritsen's going to give it another go. But both of, both yeah. the events are incredibly deep and both the events have people from a variety of countries who can factor in US, Canada, obviously, Chepta guy from Uganda, Great Britain, yeah. you have Norway, in, in addition to Kenya and Ethiopia. So it's going to be, it's going to be exciting. When you look back at, at 2019, the, the world championships you got through to the final you were one of the last guys through to the final yeah. <laughs> and then in the final in the final it was a crazy a crazy race and and the, the race kind of split in two and obviously there was a lot of a drama there at the front down the home stretch and the ingerbritsons were doing some some team tactics um yeah what's different like what would be different this year based on how much you've improved than what happened in, in, in Doha. I mean, you finished, finished 10th, but what's going to put you in that top five or in that medal uh, contention? Yeah. Um, I would just blatantly say I'm in shape this year. <laughs> when, I, uh, <laughs> when I ran in Doha, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I was out of shape, but um, you have to understand that that year I got dead last at New Balance Grand Prix. And, you know, there was a lot mm-hmm. of things in – I was severely out of shape at that point. And I worked so hard to get into shape and to get the um, the world championship standard that by the time world champs came around, I was actually dead tired. I was absolutely gassed. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I didn't think I made the final. And then I heard that I was like the last qualifier just by milliseconds. And um, mm-hmm. I was still able to retain a top 10 position being 10th, but... I think this year, all around, my training has been um, overall more consistent. I knew where I had to be, and uh, I started off on a good track, and I've been healthy. And um, I think just going into the Olympics this year, I'm ready to go. Um, I'm a lot stronger than I've ever been. Um, My speed's always there. So I think that that'll be probably the main difference is that uh, I won't be gassed heading into the Olympics, and I, I think I'll just be a lot stronger than I was before. Despite being what you say out of shape, you still ran 1309 in the lead up. So now if we have an in shape, Justin, what sort of times do you think you're capable of? I mean, I feel bad because I I usually just try to keep like the time piece personal, just, you know, just to avoid (laughs) people telling me if I accomplished or didn't accomplish what I set out for myself. But um, I could definitely say, um, I plan on being competitive with the best in the world. Um, I think that I could, I'll just say, I think I could go sub 13, but (laughs) there we go. We'll just leave it. We'll just leave it at that. I was trying to like play it off and like kind of give an answer that doesn't really say anything, but I felt like that answer probably would have hyped me up a little bit more than just saying sub 13. So I think sub 13 is, yeah, I won't tell you what, but sub 13 is what I'm planning on. Well, that was going to be my follow-up anyway. I was going to say, so sub-13 is what you're saying because you're saying competitive with the world. Do you get any confidence from the fact that we've seen a lot of people not just break that barrier but go through it by a significant amount or people you know, right on the doorstep? We've seen a lot of these 
time trial type races in, yeah. in, in Oregon, for example, with, you know, 1302s. Yeah. And obviously we saw, saw what Lopez did. Just the, does the volume of people make you believe even more? Okay. Hey, I can run with those guys. I, c- I can do what they're doing. Well, <laughs> I think it, I think it encourages me more to work harder at practice. Yeah. I think, you know, those guys work hard. All of them, all those people that run those times, they're, they're working like, you know, like horses out there. So I know it's not just something like they, they put on their shorts and then just go jog a, you know, a 13, whatever, or a sub 13. <laughs> I know that they had to work for it, but, um, you know, those are guys that I, I, I enjoy their company. Um, I'm friends with a lot of them uh, outside of track and field. And just to see them accomplish their goals and stuff, it encourages me to go to practice and work hard so I can accomplish mine. <laughs> All right, let's get to some of these listener questions now, Justin. We put them on Instagram. So, you know, like anything on Instagram, you get a mixed bag. It's fair to say. You get a mixed bag from what's on Instagram. So let's start here. Uh, Someone wants to know what your weekly mileage was at Syracuse. Do you remember your weekly mileage at Syracuse? Yeah, and this can be a fun question because it changed throughout every year. Um, My freshman year, I kept it at like 30 miles because I, I came from like doing maybe 20 miles in high school so it was at 30 miles um sophomore year i got up to like 40 or 45 um junior year i got up to 50 i was now in the big boy mileage area <laughs> in the zone. um and then by my senior year i i kept it at 55 and um now being a pro was it. i know nobody asked yeah 55 as a senior maybe i've touched 60 like one or two weeks but for the most part, I was doing 55 miles. And uh, now I'm at 70 or 70 slash 75, depending on what week. You won the NCAA cross country championship on 55 miles a week? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. I'm assuming a lot of intensity in those sessions. Yeah, I mean, uh, I was working hard. Um, the workouts were tough. It's just like when it came down to doubles or just easy day runs, I wasn't really running that long. Mm hmm. All right, let's stick with college. Who did you fear to race in college? Oh, man. Obviously, Ed Chez. (laughs) Every race. (laughs) uh, It didn't matter. Like, the thing about Chez was just, like, he could beat you in a sit and kick race or he can beat you in a I'm going to stretch it out from the gun race. So um, he was a tough guy to race. Obviously, Grant Fisher always kept it interesting. Uh, He's a little closer to my age. Mark Scott got me at Iowa State a bunch of times. And still, when you guys post that video, I'm just like, how did I lose this race? It looks like I'm about to win. <laughs> um, he's a good guy to race. Uh, Tiernan's a tough guy. There, there's a lot of great guys that I raced in NCAA, to be honest. Morgan McDonald, mm-hmm. too. He's a guy I raced a lot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. you forget that you guys did have some, some races because he had that redshirt year, and then he came back. And was just yeah. a world beater once he once he came back from the the red shirt year and the injuries is on a whole whole new level. That have been that have been a fun race to see 20, 2017 night versus 20, yeah. 2018, 2019 McDonald McDonald. Yeah. Well, I remember it was uh, after uh, it was after World Champs, and I talked to him. I was like, "Yo, what's going on, bro? Are you gonna you gonna run twenty seventeen cross country?" Because I was trying to figure out whether or not I wanted to do it, and he's like, "Ah." I don't think so. Like, we'll see. Like, I'll just see how I'm recovered. And, you know, he ended up not doing it, but it worked out for him. It would have been interesting. Yeah. And yeah, it worked out for both you guys. Both got that, both got that title. What do you miss? This is the next, next question here from the listeners. What do you miss the most and least about Canada? Ooh, what do I miss the most and least? Uh, I don't know if this counts, but like, I miss my family the most, you know, majority of my family lives in Canada. I miss seeing them and my friends, uh, aside from family, there's like a couple of things. Like we have this, we have all dressed ruffles chips. Those are like amazing. We don't have them. We don't have them down here and trying to think, I don't really like poutine that much, so I can't put that on the list, but I can tell you what I miss the least is, uh, Hmm. the snow, the snow is. I don't care for that at all, except for on Christmas. But other than that. When you went to upstate New York, where there's a lot of snow too, 
and then I guess you're moving. Are you going to keep moving progressively farther <laughs> to warmer and warmer? Yeah, we're going to Wait, was there next. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> taking your talents to South Beach. Was there more snow in, in Canada or in Syracuse? Oh, there was more snow in Syracuse for sure. For sure. Okay. But, um, but you still went there. Life, I still went there. Like I was used to it. Okay. And I, I, I'm not going to lie. Like since moving to Virginia, I think I've become like a little more of a baby. I'm a little spoiled down here in the winters, but um, I do. I actually do enjoy the snow. I think it makes me work hard and it like makes me grind a lot harder. Um, I found that it helped out in cross country where, you know, I'm going to call, I won't, I won't call the specific team out, but there's like a lot of schools that do have nice weather uh, where they train. <laughs> and I felt like they weren't prepared for Terre Haute or even a cold Louisville race. So I, I felt like going to Syracuse actually helped me out in cross country. Fair enough. The next question we got, the listener wants to know, how does it feel representing black distance runners during a turbulent period over the past year? Oh, man. I mean, that's a tough question. I feel like I, I love being black. I think like it's, it's part of my identity. I do everything I can to represent the black community in a positive light. Um, it's just been tough, honestly, just like seeing the amount of like tragedies that's been surrounding our culture, um, especially living down south where I've experienced my own uh, bouts with racism down here too. And um, I don't know, I don't know. It, it's just really tough for me. Um, it's something that, you know, I don't enjoy waking up and seeing this stuff on the news. I wish it wasn't like that. Um, but I do know that for the black community, for, you know, black distance runners that do look up to me, that I can try my best to be um, just there for the community in any way, shape, or form. So if that means me being a good role model or reaching out to kids when they need me, like that's just a part of what I'll do. Changing gears here a little bit. Uh, favorite event to watch in track, and then they asked least favorite event, but I don't want you to you know make enemies <laughs> with some like random event out there. So. <laughs> Yeah, let's see. There, um, we don't need a just a night discus thrower beef right now in 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 the world. We don't need to put that out. We there, don't so. need that at all because they uh, they would beat me up. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and I actually I actually enjoy watching them because it just baffles me. Like not at Syracuse, but when I was in high school, sometimes I'd like go hang out with the throwers at my school, and like they let me try whatever event like they that they're preparing for, and it just baffles me that they're able to throw whatever they were throwing for that far um mm -hmm. i think my favorite event to watch in the olympics being like a spectator i love watching the 200 meter um that's mm. my favorite event i think you know it's the 100 kind of short where i like i don't i love watching it but the 200 you kind of like see how things play out i don't know if that makes sense but i do enjoy that event a lot um the 1500 and the 800s are definitely right up there for me. I think, I think definitely the 1500 over the eight, but the eight's still really entertaining. You got a pick for us men's 800 at the Olympic trials this year, Brazier, Hopple, uh, Donovan Brazier. <laughs> okay. I think Donovan, no hesitation. I'm cool with, no hezzy. Uh, I'm cool with Bryce too. I think <laughs> Bryce is not going to make it easy for Donovan. I, it's just watching that kid run and seeing him grow throughout the years. He's, he's a friend of mine too. So, um, and actually both, I'm both friends with, uh, Bryce and Donovan, but Donovan's just, I, I'm scared of that kid. <laughs> Even if, when he steps up to the 1500, I'm scared of him. So, uh, he'll be my pick. <laughs> okay. If you see him on the line in a, in a 5k, you just go the other way, basically is what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I, I would try it. That's where you'd see me have a leader race. I would not let him <laughs> be close, close to me with 200 meters to go. <laughs> uh I like it. I like it. Uh, favorite cheat meal. I don't know if you organize your diet like that, but if you do. Uh, I mean, to be honest, <laughs> that was part of the thing that kind of had me out of shape when uh, back in 2019, I guess you can say, leading up to world champs. But I guess my favorite cheat meal, I love barbecue. And I don't know if it's because I live down south now, but, you know, ribs, pulled pork, even like the pastrami they have down here uh chicken wings i love chicken wings so sometimes like i'll just have all of them at the same time which is probably 
<laughs> not the best idea, but I just love all sorts of barbecue and chicken wings. Did you get barbecue when you were in Austin for that race? No, nah, I didn't because my race ended a little late. And then mm. uh, by the time I left the track, all the barbecue places were closed. So I, you know, I settled for tacos, which were still pretty good. <laughs> that's a good, that's a good one B choice. If you're in, if you're in Austin, yeah. but <laughs> next time, next time got to get to the barbecue, put that pre-order in or something like that. Uh, next question. You'll never guess who submitted this question, Justin. It says, rumor has it Rob Heppenstall can beat you one-on-one -on -one in basketball. Is this true? <laughs> that is 100% cap. I've seen Rob play basketball. Uh, he dribbles with two hands. He shoots with two hands. We're, we're not in the same league when it comes to, when it comes to basketball. He can, he can probably get me in hockey because he's Canadian. but Well, we're both Canadian, but uh, <laughs> not basketball. You mentioned in that piece we did, you were the best – basketball player amongst the distance running community do you still stand by that statement i stand by that um i do think that even some of the sprinters like the top level sprinters i don't think that they could beat me in basketball but um mm -hmm. i 100 percent know for sure that there's no distance runner 800 meter and up that is touching me in basketball 100 percent. You, you know josh thompson of the barman track club can dunk you've heard that before we actually had a conversation about that right, right before the race in Austin. But I, I do know he can dunk, but I would not let him dunk on me. There's no way. Okay. What was that conversation like? You're getting ready to run a 1500 and he's like, hey, you know, I can dunk? Or did you bring it up? What happened? Uh, I, I mean, I brought it up. Uh, we, were, okay. we were just fooling around talking. I, I asked him what Mo, Mo Ahmed was up to. And, you know, naturally I started talking about basketball. And then, you know, we, it, it was all me. It wasn't Josh. I was just talking a okay. lot of smack, I think. <laughs> I mean, because if I was him, I'd bring up every, at every opportunity I got, I would bring up the fact that I could dunk, especially if I was world class in another sport. I would just find ways to include it in a conversation because I'd be so proud of myself. It's pretty amazing. He's not a tall guy. I would be too. Yeah, not a tall guy. And like, as soon as I started, I used to be able to grab the rim like pretty, I was, so I could grab, like if this was the rim, I was grabbing mm -hmm. it like this back in high school. And oh, as wow. soon as I started running, I couldn't touch the rim anymore. And I'd be surprised if I could. Well, I, I think I could touch the backboard still. But uh, I'm just impressed that I, I want to know how much mileage he's doing because how did he keep his balance, you know? Oh, 100%. I think maybe you did too many miles in Syracuse. <laughs> and that's why you couldn't dunk anymore. You should have dropped yeah. it even lower. You should have tried to win nationals on 40 yeah. or something like that, but still dunking. Should have told coach, hey, put me on the hurdler <laughs> mileage. Like, <laughs> that's it. This is, dunking is more important mile. to me than actually running well. <laughs> How are you feeling about the, the Raptors right now? I know it's been a, oh. in a tough season. They're in a fight for that play-in. Were, were you happy that Lowry stuck around? There were some trade rumors there about him going – Going to the Sixers. Yeah. Uh, it's It's been a tough year. Honestly, I haven't been able to catch most of the games because being in Virginia, I have to watch the Washington Wizards play, which is ridiculous because <laughs> they suck. <laughs> They're so bad. Uh, I love Bradley Beal and I love Russell Westbrook like as players, um, but their mm -hmm. team is just awful to watch. I usually don't even watch them play. But um, the Raptors, I was really – I was sorry – their season has been pretty disappointing, but um, mm -hmm. I think they're just re rebuilding the team chemistry again. I'm glad that Kyle Lowry stayed. I'd love to see him retire as a Raptor. So um, as long as we get to the playoffs, I think we can make a decent run. And they're playing their games in Florida this whole year. I don't know if you have a sense of it. Like, yeah. what do people, what are Raptors fans, how do they feel about this season, seeing as how they're playing <laughs> not even in their home country this year? Uh, I mean, I don't think that the Raptors fans are too bothered about it. Um, to be honest, like the protocols in Canada around COVID are crazy. Like even if they were playing in Canada, there's no way that um, our premier or our prime minister would even let fans into the <laughs> into the stadium. Yeah. So I, I don't think they're too bothered about that. But I do know like a lot of Canadians are a little bit frustrated about uh, the COVID protocols right now. They got their title. You got your title, right? You're good for a few more years. Yeah. If they and don't make the playoffs, the you got your title. <laughs> yeah. I was at the parade. 
that was cool. Yeah. So like as a sports fan, you sort of reached your, 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 your peak there, right? I'm, I guess, are you, are you more a Raptors fan than you are any other sport? Is that your primary one? Yeah, I, w- I, I would say so. I would say the Raptors, um, I'm a big fan of theirs. Obviously the Maple Leafs, I always cheer for them in hockey. Um, right. I actually, I, my mom hates when I say this, but I actually, I thought that I'd be dead before the Raptors won a championship, but you know, to be, I think, what was I, maybe like 22, 23 when they won, like that was really exciting to see. And uh, as I said, like I, I flew home like the next day to go to the parade and it was just awesome to be a part of that. So I, I never thought I'd experience that in my lifetime. Yeah, I'm a Spurs fan, so it stings a little bit because uh, the whole Kawhi uh, angle. Yeah. So I'm going to move on. <laughs> I'm going to move on. But hey, I love DeMar DeRozan. I love DeMar DeRozan. Uh, he's Can been great. Hit a game. <laughs> Yeah, right now you want him. Now you want him. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we want him back uh, now. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's uh, he, man. He plays hard and he gives he gives everything. You, you you can't take anything away from that guy, and he cares, which which is uh, not not always the case, especially especially when someone gets traded against their will uh, and had nothing to do with it. Um, yeah, another one from from probably someone you know. This, this is the last question we have here. Why is Alex Lamong better than you at FIFA? I knew that some way, some form, this guy was his question was going to make it into this. He is not better than me at FIFA. See, like, I'll ask this guy to play when I'm actually awake and alert. Like, you know, at a regular time, like maybe 2 p.m. He shouldn't be in class. Yeah. Or actually, he might be in class. But uh, <laughs> then he'll, like, he'll always wait till it's, like, 9.30. And be like, yo, let's play. And I'm like, bro, like, I'm tired. I'm about to get ready for bed. And it's like, no, no, come play night, come play. So I ended up playing with them. And then, like, you know, usually I win. But then there's a couple times where he wins. And then, like, I won't hear, like, I'll hear it all day, all week from him. And he's not better than me in FIFA. Let's just say that. It, he catches is me FIFA the, the game you play the most? Yeah, right now. So, I mean, it used to be Fortnite back in the day, probably in college. But um as a pro fifa we actually have we have a pretty big group uh we all hop online uh it's me a couple sprinters actually alex hops online um and my brother hops online too and it, it gets pretty it gets pretty rowdy when we play so it's it's a lot of a lot of fun and very entertaining who's the best track fifa player this guy named Dwayne. <laughs> Dwayne Asamoda, I think his last name is. Uh, he ran at I- uh, Ohio State. Um, he's team. Okay. He was teammates with Alex when Alex was at Ohio State. But yeah, I'll give Dwayne his props. I'm I'm close to getting like just as good as him. But he, some of these guys, I feel like they spend too much time on the sticks. Like they're they're playing way too much. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what they're doing with the rest of their time. So, <laughs> who's the most famous person you've played video games with? Most famous person. Um, I mean, I'm friends with Jakob. Jakob's pretty cool, but we, we won't play FIFA together. We play we usually play Fortnite if we do play anything. Um, he's really good at that game, I would say. It's kind of embarrassing. Wait, wait, wait. Cause... Wait, Jakob? Ingebrigtsen. Oh, <laughs> okay. I didn't know it was Jakob. <laughs> yeah. Wow, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> My bad. I was like, how many guys are named Jakob in the world? But I forgot, like, you know, Flowtrax International. It's not just a North American thing. Well, you was just, it was a first name basis too. You just you ease right into it. It was no big deal. Okay, so he's he's good. He's good. Yeah, he's Jakob's good at Fortnite. He's uh he definitely carried me. Uh mind you, I haven't played the game for a while when I played with him and then you know, we were a decent team. I don't think we got a dub, uh, which is probably my doing. Um another guy that I played with was Paul Chalimo, and he doesn't want the mm-hmm. smoke in FIFA no more. He actually I think he switched <laughs> gaming systems just so that he does can't play with me no more. Um, funny thing about him was like, I was actually beating him in FIFA and then I think he did something where it's like, you switch your Wi-Fi on and off. And I think he like was messing around with the Wi-Fi and ended up losing to him, but (laughs) he was another guy that was way back in college when I was playing Paul, but yeah. Wow. Okay. So the time zones between you and Jakob, how does it work out? Or does he only do it when he's training in the U S I'm curious how much work goes into setting up these games? (laughs) No, I mean, honestly, that's not something I actually thought about. And uh, I don't even know how we we actually scheduled it. I just think, like, he hit me up. 
it definitely was mm-hmm. probably nighttime for him over there because um, he was done with his training and stuff. And, you know, after my morning sessions, I'm pretty free all day. So we just we just hopped on the sticks a couple of times. Um, and, yeah, and we just played some games. He's a cool kid. Honestly, that whole – the Ingebrigtsen family, like, I got nothing but love for them. Uh, the dad's a really nice guy. Jakob, Philip, and Hendrik have been – you know, those guys are really great dudes. I've always had great conversations with them. So, yeah. When's your next race? I'm running – in Eugene, I think, yeah, it's next week, the 24th. I'll, I'll be out there for a race. 1500? Is this the Olympic standard race? <laughs> I don't I don't know what type of race. It all depends on uh, how fast everybody's trying to go. But, um, yeah, I mean, I'm running a 1500, but uh, we'll see. I, I, I think we'll have a strong feel. You know, it's Oregon who doesn't want to go out there. And I think um, the one thing that – you know, you never asked me this question, but I'll just say the one thing that I've been really focused on since 2020 and kind of moving into 2021 is I don't really focus too much on times anymore. Um, I just think that the main focus is trying to win the race and being competitive. And mm-hmm. that being said, like, I know I'm racing against like some of the best people in the world and stuff like that. So it's pretty hard to win every race that you go into, but that's just the mindset that I have. And, um, you know, through winning races, through being competitive like that, the times will come. So um, I think that's just the way my mindset's been. And uh, moving forward, like, I don't know if the Olympic standard will come in that race. I I think we'll have some good guys in it, but um, I think I'm just going to try to be as competitive as possible. All right. I think you're going to get it. That was good. (laughs) I mean, I I, I understand what you're saying there, but I think we're going to see sub 13 and I think we're going to see a sub 235 this year, but you don't have to respond. That's just me putting out out my opinion well, based on you. following your career the last uh, couple of years. Uh, as we mentioned, the Flow Film up on our YouTube page, the Justin Knight taking care of business, Syracuse Flow Film, and then also the behind the scenes at Peyton Jordan. If you ever want to see what happens in the eight, <laughs> ten hours before uh, a, a pro gets to the starting line, check it out. It was a lot of fun. You can see Justin Hoop. Uh, Justin, That's thanks. Awesome. Thanks again for coming on. Thanks again for having me, Kevin.